everyone. Thank you for coming to our annual women's lecture. This year, Dame Pro um, Professor E.J. Milner Gulland will deliver our lecture. She's the Tasso Leventis Professor of Biodiversity at the University of Oxford and the Director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Conservation Science, also at the University of Oxford. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for giving the talk. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's an incredible honor to be here and to talk to you. Um, and I hope to tell you a little bit exciting about um, a project and a species that's very dear to my heart. But I'm gonna start with a little bit of a new college journey. Um, so this is me, oops, this isn't me. <laughs> this is me. Uh, in my school in 1985, our leavers picture, I'm the one with the red circle. You probably can't see back there. Um, but it's a classic example of 1980s um, dress. And um, so I was thinking about coming to Oxford and flicking through the prospectus with my dad. And um, for each college, he wrote something like Christchurch, big, or, you know, I don't know, um, Merton very small and old or something. And we came to New College quite a long way through, being N, and he just gave it a big tick and wrote best. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, who am I to argue with that? So I came, um, I applied, and came to read Pure and Applied Biology, which was a degree that uh, had about five years of uh, existence in the 80s and was brilliant. It was not a usual thing for uh, someone in my part of the world to go to Oxford, so much so that I was in the local paper, off to Oxford. Um, and even then it said, Jane 17 wants to be a conservationist. Um, although it was not a terribly reliable uh, article because at the end it said, um, her only other interest is riding horses, which I thought was a little bit unfair seeing as I was sitting at a piano. <laughs> um, but there you go. Um, so that was exciting. I turned up and I had a, a wonderful three years and a huge thanks to my two tutors, George Radcliffe, who's sitting here, and Richard Dawkins, who were uh, just instrumental in giving me the chance to, uh, to kind of flourish, to pursue my own interests, and to write essays like Game Theory and How It Will Save the World and that kind of thing. Um, it was really just a privilege to... to um, be the duty of Richard and, uh, and George. So, had a lovely time. New College is very close to my heart, not just because of my time as an undergraduate, which you can see there, that one there, but also because I came back after my PhD and was the Christopher Cox Fellow. And for New College people, uh, you don't need to, to know what that is, but you know, it's, it's a fellow that is both a junior research fellow, but also has a, has a welfare role. And at my t and when I was there, it had the most enormous budget for uh, drinks <laughs> <laughs> and dinner, <laughs> which I spent. <laughs> and anything that wasn't spent became a huge champagne and strawberries reception at the, on the last Saturday of Trinity term every year. Happy days. And then even happier days because I met my husband here when I was a junior research fellow, and we were the first fellows to get married, uh, which is obviously because uh, there hadn't been women for very long um, at the time. So, you know, I don't think there are very many other people who can claim to be an undergraduate, an alumnus, a member of the SCR, and a spouse. If there's anyone else, then um, please put your hand up. So, after being at New College, I went to Imperial College to do my PhD. And um, as I was a kind of pure and applied biologist, I was looking for something that was, um, something that was actually going to give science into policy. So not just biology, but that actually made a difference in the real world. And um, I turned up at Imperial College and my, um, my supervisor had just been given a consultancy by um, the UN uh, Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species to think about uh, whether the ivory trade was the cause of the um, decline in elephants in the 1980s. And he had no one else to do it, so he gave it to me, which was amazing because I was part of 
a huge kind of um, political uh, debate right at the very beginning, age 21. It was also quite alarming, and I, I didn't work on elephants again for 30 years after that because I was so uh, stressed by the whole idea of being right there in the heart of things. So I was there in Kenya when um, the president burnt five tons of ivory in a political gesture. I then moved on to think about rhinos, which are quite similar to elephants, and think about the dehorning of rhinos, and also the uh, use for rhinos in traditional medicine. And that was all great, but I had a couple of chapters left in my PhD and couldn't think what to do. I'd always had a fascination with Russia, Russian art, Russian history, and, uh, and the Soviet Union, as was then, because my father is a professor of art history, and uh, Russian art history in particular, and so it was always very romantic. You know, he'd bring home icons, he'd bring home dissident poets, and um, things like that. And so I really, really wanted to go to Russia. And I found a link between rhino horn and a species of antelope called the saiga, which lives only in the former Soviet Union. And that was through traditional medicine. So here's some pictures I took uh, of saigas on sale in, um, in Hong Kong and in Singapore for various kind of traditional um, kind of it's, they're a cooling medicine, so they're used for uh, heatiness, for when you've got a bit of a cold and liver disease and that kind of thing. So um, that was a link, and that was enough of a link to allow me to get a, Brit a British Council grant to go to uh, the Soviet Union to do some kind of modelling work. I was a population modeller at the time around Saigas. So there I went, and... Um, it was amazing. I, went, I had a chance to go to Kazakhstan to see if I could find saiga antelopes. And I only had a week. I went out in the field and we were bumping along in this kind of big Land Rover on um, unpaved roads, um, sandy, bumpy, and we, we drove for two and a half days. I think we would have drove, driven for less if we hadn't constantly got stuck in salt pans and had to spend 12 hours pulling ourselves out. We also would have got a bit quicker if we hadn't always suspiciously had to go to a herder's yurt at lunchtime to see if they had found any saigas, if, to see if they could direct us towards the herd of saigas. And it was very suspicious that every time we needed to know whether there were any saigas in the vicinity, it was lunchtime. And it always took two hours for us to get out again. Um, so, yeah, we didn't find any, and I was getting a bit desperate because we were on our last day. And then, as we were driving at night um, on this sandy track, uh, there was a little baby Saigus in the middle of the road in danger of being run over, this little chap here. Um, that was the only Saiga I saw on that trip. Um, and I fell in love. I mean, wouldn't you? What a beautiful creature. Um, and that was 33 years ago, so I've been doing saiga work ever since. So that's why I want to tell you this story of this antelope and how its fortunes have changed over that 33 years and some of the things that have, I've been able to contribute. So now we're rushing forward to the present day, actually last week. So last week I was in Samarkand at the UN Convention on Migratory Species, which was brilliant. Here's me in the Congress Hall. So this is when all the governments of the world who've signed a UN Convention, like this one on Migratory Species, they come together and they discuss and then they make resolutions, and those resolutions in principle then go to national legislation, and that national legislation means that they start conserving their species better. I think there's a little leap of faith somewhere along that line. Um, but, those of you who can see the pictures, you might see that in the background is a saiga antelope up on the big screen. They were the kind of poster species for this session. And that's partly because, or mostly because the saigas live in Uzbekistan. So it's one of those species which, um, you know, they have as, as, this is one of the species that my country is conserving. But it was also because there was some success to celebrate. And there's nothing like governments like more than being able to celebrate success. So this is an official side event which I chaired. 
Um, and it's about success in transboundary cooperation for the Saiga antelope. And you might not be able to see, but I'm flanked by men in dark suits. Um, they are the ministry representatives of the various governments that have Saigas, uh, so Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Mongolia. And they were there to say how wonderful their government had been in conserving this species. So why could we celebrate that success? Well, the, there's this, the IUCN, the World Conservation Union, is the kind of official body that monitors the conservation status of species around the world. And they have this categorization of species from extinct in the wild, which is a bad thing to be, to least concern, which is where we want to be. And that's a list of the continuum there. In 2002, the Saiga antelope came straight in at number one. It went straight from near threatened, which is just the one just before least concern, to critically endangered. Um, and that was the, the kind of biggest jump that you can possibly get as a species beyond just going straight extinct. So in 2002, disaster struck. In 2023, we had a similar leap backwards from critically endangered back down to near threatened all in one go, again, really unprecedented. And that is the thing that allowed us to have this celebration and why the Saiga last week was the species that everyone was talking about. So I'm gonna tell you how we went up and then how we went down again. And I hope that will illustrate some kind of interesting things around how um, nature conservation interplays with geopolitics, with culture, with heritage and with livelihoods. So, what is a saiga? Here they are. And again, just so you can admire what a beautiful species it is. Um, the males have horns and the females don't. They're a migratory species that goes in big herds through the steppes of Eurasia. So, um, they migrate um, north and south and they, they give birth in huge aggregations. They're a wonderful species. They're also a very remarkably fertile species. So they're a species that's able to bounce back, and that's because of its adaptation to the harsh climate of the steppe. So if you can imagine, in really harsh winters, lots of them die, and they're adapted to be able to shoot back up again, to have lots of babies, and, and then when the next harsh winter comes, they crash again. The reason why they migrate is because of this latitudinal gradient in different kinds of ecosystems and weather. So right, this is Kazakhstan. Right at the bottom of Kazakhstan, there's the mountain ranges of the Tian Shan that go into the Himalayas. Right at the top of Kazakhstan is the boreal forest that goes into Siberia. In the middle, there's these stripes of different kinds of habitat. So at the bottom, there's the clay desert that has shrubs, and uh, not that much snow. So in the winter, the saigas can nibble away on the shrubs. You know, they're OK. Further up, you get from the semi-desert into the steppe lands. In the steppe lands, you have really good grass in the summer, very high grass, and in the winter, very high snow. It gets down to minus 40. That's no place for, a, for an ungulate. And so what they do is that in the summer they go up to get the grass and then in the winter they come back down to escape the cold weather. By the way, that's also what uh, livestock herders used to do in the old days. So both saigas and livestock will go backwards and forwards. And this thing that saigas and livestock both migrate is kind of part of a broader cultural heritage that this species has. It's really intertwined with the culture of of this region. It's the symbol of the nomadic free steppe. So, but it is something that has been kind of broader than Kazakhstan. So it's a Pleistocene relic. It was first, you know, noticed, you can see fossils in the Pleistocene times, along with woolly mammoths, along with saber-toothed cats, those kinds of exciting species that aren't there anymore. So the saiga is the exciting species that survived. So here's some uh, rock carvings. Uh, there's some, um, some ones from Kazakhstan, petroglyphs, where saigas are, are kind of etched on the stone. And then the other one is from Rufinyak 
in southern France, and again, saigas that are in amongst all the other wonderful species. Saiga is a survivor, though. When all the others uh, went extinct, they contracted into this steppe area where they are now. They've always been hunted by people. They've been hunted for food and for their skins. So what we've got here is an aerial photo of something called an aran, and that is a hunting um, corral in which the, um, the hunters for millennia have been driving them into this corral, and then they, they kill them. Now, just for size, I don't know if you can see, but I'll just point it out. There's a car. So that other picture is the, corral, is the corral, and then right at the tip is a four-wheel drive. It shows how big it is. Um, so this is from like, the 12th century, and they're all over the Saiga range. They're starting to now be seen because of the aerial photography and LIDAR and things like that. So it's always been part of the culture. They're differently thought of at different parts of the range. So like I say, in Kazakhstan, they're the symbol of the steppe. In Kalmykia, right in the far west of the Saiga Range, which is part of southern Russia, they're the only Buddhists in, um, in Europe, the Buddhist culture in Europe. And there, the Saiga is, is kind of, is the consort of a, of, a, of a Buddhist kind of god called the White Old Man. And he is from the center of the capital of Kalmykia, which is this western uh, extent of the range in southern Russia. And the capital there, they have a statue of the white old man who's, who's a god who protects nature with a saiga at his side. And then the other, the other picture of the amulet is from Uzbekistan, uh, where they also think of saigas as something special and precious. Things changed a little bit for the worse in the Russian Empire. So in the Russian Empire, just like in the, uh, the British Empire, which went to Africa and killed as many animals as possible, and then said how sad they were, oh no, I just killed the last rhino in South Africa, what a tragedy. Uh, there's a similar thing in the Russian Empire. So if you go and look in the books in the Moscow Library or in St. Petersburg, there's all these travelers' tales from the 19th century, in which they talk about how the saiga covered the steppes, and then how they were all killed and loads of horns were transmitted to China for tra traditional medicine and then there were hardly any left. And actually what happened to stop that was the advent of the Soviet Union. That was when uh, the borders with, with China were closed and that is when uh, people, their guns were taken away and uh, the Saiga were able to recover. So by the 1980s they were back to being pretty abundant. Um, here's some pictures from the 80s, uh, taken by my friends at the Institute of Zoology in Kazakhstan. So those black lines that look like ants are actually saigas, and all the white lines are all the saiga tracks on the steppe. There were about one to two million of them then. Um, people did science, so the bottom picture is one of my friends, uh, Yuri, Yuri Grachov, who was working on saiga ecology, and they also hunted them. They hunted them in a way that was relatively sustainable uh, for food, for pelts, for, for horns. Then came the breakup of the Soviet Union. That was traumatic, hugely traumatic for the people. So the top picture here is a village which I'd visited a few years before and was a thriving village, a collective farm with lots of livestock. Um, then in Kazakhstan, what happened at the, at the independence was that the state just withdrew all subsidy from the collective farmers and said, you're on your own. And what happened was that all the shepherds took away all the livestock, all the sheep, and, and just took them for their own. The collective farm heads took all the machinery, and that was theirs, and everybody else just had nothing to do. So all the teachers, the, biz the, the accountants, everybody else had nothing to do. And those who could left and went to the city, and those who couldn't had to stay and um, had to make their living somehow. At the same time, all the money for science and for management uh, was gone. And so there, were, there was no protection for the step, no more science, nothing of, like that. And you can imagine, it's pretty obvious what happens when something like that happens. So the obvious happened, which was there was a huge amount of poaching. 
that was poaching both for people to live, to eat, and also for export of the horns to China for the Chinese traditional medicine market. And that bottom picture is one haul of saiga horn that came through Chinese customs um, about four or five years ago. Quite impressive. So that is the story of why the saiga in, 20, in 2002 came straight in at critically endangered. So this picture here is the population size of saigas. You can see it bouncing along at about a million, a million and a half, through the 80s and into the early 90s. Then we have a gap in the graph, and that's when there was no management, no science, so no one was counting saigas for four years. Then the surveys resumed, and in that four-year period, the saiga population had halved, and then it halved every year for the next five years. All in all, that was a 95% decline in this population over a 10-year period, which is the fastest recorded for a mammal, and that is why it went straight in at critically endangered. So, where was I in this time? So, I started work on saigas in 1990. I was working, uh, so following on from my work on elephants and rhinos, I came in to do population modeling about sustainable use of saigas and life history, ecology, all that kind of thing. And then it became apparent that things were not as good as they could, as they could be. My species was disappearing beneath my feet as I was working on it. But in those first few years, the science was great. It was very strange, actually, because I was an early postdoc. I was 23, 24. And I got loads of money from the EU because they had this reconstruction fund for post-Soviet science. And they, were, they didn't have very many people applying for it. I got 10 years' worth of money for this. And it had to be big, international, collaborative consortium projects working on something or other. So I did stuff on life history strategy, parasites, um, red listing, all sorts of stuff. Um, a very strange position for a young woman to be in, I would have to say, because it's a hugely hierarchical science uh, establishment, the Academy of Sciences in, in the former Soviet Union. And here's some pictures of me uh, giving talks and leading these things. And you can see there's a lot of men in suits. Um, they found me very strange as well, but we got on. It was fine. Uh, we, we reached an understanding. Um, I think they were particularly confused by my vegetarianism and by the fact that I brought students who were also vegetarians. They were always very, very happy when I brought someone who ate meat. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was, it was an interesting time and a, and a very formative time for me. So my students came, they did fun projects, they went out into the steppe and weighed saigas, it was a happy time. We generated all sorts of, map, of graphs and figures, um, which, yeah, that's just, this illustration is science. <laughs> um, however, we then started to realize that um, we couldn't go on with this. Apart from anything else, my students couldn't find any saigas to weigh anymore. Um, so we started to move into social science. And that was really important to me because now I guess I'm more of a social scientist than I am an ecologist. And it really started with witnessing this horrendous decline of the species. So we got some money to start thinking about what it was that was making people into poachers. And this is one of the graphs I like. So, my student went into a village, uh, several villages across the steppe, and asked people to list all the jobs that you could do in that village. And then what we did was we asked them to rank those jobs along various dimensions, including uh, prestige, physical risk, uh, profitability, those kinds of dimensions. There were about six of them. And then we could rank them according to their preferability. So things that came out very high were things like administrator, businessman, farmer, uh, teacher, those kinds of things. The bottom one, the one that's way down the bottom, is being female. <laughs> um, not so good. And the one just above it that I've put a little circle around is being a saiga poacher. And so it wasn't something that people were doing because of the ranks, you know, because it was a great profession. They were doing it because they had nothing else to do. So, that was helpful in informing the kind of 
conservation that people might want to put in place, including us. So, you know, it was, a, it was interesting times because there was no civil society, there were no NGOs. And so we had to kind of bring in all that kind of, what does conservation mean? What, what can villagers do? And one of the things we did was founding the Saiga Conservation Alliance. It's an NGO that I'm the chair of. It's still, be, it's still going after 17 years. And that is an NGO uh, in the UK, but we do networks, networking all around the world, and we try to raise money for Saigas and also support things. One of the things I'm most proud of is Saiga News. Check it out. It is everything you ever wanted to know about Saigas twice a year. Um, <laughs> And I did that because of a frustration with the fact that people in the international community, all these international conventions, were talking about saigas uh, at this very high level and how to conserve them, whereas the people on the ground who were actually doing the work were not being talked to at all. You know, there was none of their expertise. You know, years, decades of science were being ignored because it was in another language. And so this comes in, in six languages, English, Chinese, Kazakh, Uzbek, Mongolian, and Russian. And it's supposed to be a publication where you have things about, my school did this wonderful uh, day of migratory species, here's a report on it that the teachers would like, all the way up to reports on international uh, meetings. So yeah, we do that, we did a lot of education work, we also importantly are the technical coordinators for the Memorandum of Understanding on the Saiga Antelope under the Convention on Migratory Species, which is where I was last week. And as the coordinator, you have a huge amount of power because we write the action plans, we write the status reports, and then uh, governments agree to them. I was a real skeptic about this because I thought it's just another talking shop. But actually governments take the UN seriously, or at least these governments do, and that action plan, that kind of framework really helped to drive money and conservation action towards Saiga um, conservation. It took a lot of meetings, it took a lot of collaboration, took a lot of getting people together, but by 2015 we were thinking, we were feeling pretty good about things. And I think tip to budding conservationists, every time you feel good about things, something horrible is around the corner. Um, never feel complacent. But here we were, April 2015, my friends from uh, Kazakhstan went out and did some surveys. I don't know if you can see, but this is a picture of saigas stretching to the horizons. They were about a quarter of the size that they were in the 80s and 90s, the populations at that time. But that was pretty good, given that they were right down near extinction only a few years earlier. April 2015. May 2015. So, saigas, as I said, gather to give birth in huge aggregations. Over a period of two weeks, huge numbers of saigas just dropped dead in where they stood giving birth. I don't know if you can see, but those white dots of bodies stretching into the distance, the females just dropped dead. Horrific. So, Going back to the picture of the Saigas population, here we have the 80s, everything's fine. Here we have the early 2000s, collapse. Here we have the kind of things starting to get better, going up to 2015. And then in one population, we lost 88% of the population in two weeks. And that was two thirds of the whole world's population of Saigas. Wow. It made the press. It made The Guardian, it made a, a lot of things, um, and it even made White House, uh, White House conspiracy theorists. <laughs> Barack Obama was blamed, that's how much the world noticed. So more spectacular climate fraud from the White House. Nobody knows why these antelope died, it looks very suspicious to me. Um, so, we got a team together, because we'd been collaborating for so long, we could get out there really quickly. My friend Richard, who's a vet, he loves nothing more than cutting up dead antelopes. So he was on a plane, I'm serious. <laughs> he, he was on a plane to Kazakhstan within two days, cutting up dead antelopes, there he is. Um, he had a master's student out there at the time, uh, and there, there she is there with her field lab. 
She had just the best gig, so I've sent out loads of master's students. You go out, the sunshine, the larks are tweeting, the baby cygers are sitting there looking cute. You take a swab or two, there's your master's. She was there and they started dying on her. What a horrific thing to do as a master's project. Um, but she stepped up and the bottom picture, I try not to have too many horrible pictures for you, but this is what they found, which is massive internal bleeding. It was something called um, hemorrhagic septicemia, which basically means massive internal bleeding. Um, and it was caused by a bacterium called Pasteurella. So my job, given that I'm not someone who goes out and cuts antelopes up, my job was to sit and write a grant proposal to get loads of money so that they could do that, but also to try to think about the ecology, the life history, try to understand why this might have happened. Has it ever happened before? We went and looked at the folklore of Kazakhstan, the poetry, because this was 200,000 animals dead on the steppe. You would think if that had happened before, someone would have noticed. Uh, but there was nothing in all the books, actually all the work I did for my PhD going back to the 19th century literature came in handy. Nothing um, about this kind of thing. We found two instances where it had happened before. 1981 and 1988. Nothing before that, weirdly. Um, there were other die-offs, like there were die-offs because of foot and mouth disease, there were die-offs because of cold winters, but nothing like this. Here's a picture from 1988. Could be the same picture as from 2015. It was pretty clear that this is the same thing. So pastoralosis, this bacterium, is a weird one because it lives in the respiratory tract and the guts of, of cygas naturally, causes no issues. So why was it that it was suddenly just killing every antelope? And um, we still actually don't know the answer. We know what kind of triggered it. It was warmer and wetter than usual in the days before they gave birth. When you give birth, um, your, immune, your immune system drops really badly, so you know, you're much more susceptible during the time of giving birth. But that doesn't answer why, why this bacterium suddenly switched to virulence, and we still don't know the answer to that, TBD. In the meantime, the Saigas did what they do best and grew. They reproduced, and now, We've got another problem. So this is a picture that we took uh, last year in the Ural population, which is another population in Kazakhstan. And you might just see at the back, there's a farm. Um, so these saigas are right on communal land, right next to the villages, um, grazing away happily. I was so happy when I went there in May last year as, as part of an expert mission. Um, I stood there, on, so we, we drove to near a village, we stopped at a petrol station, and a guy said, there's some saigas just over there, like 100 yards. And I said, no. Every time I'd seen a saiga over the last 30 years, I just saw their back ends running away. They're terrified of people, and, and you know, they're not, they don't do this in front of you. So we drove, we parked on the road, along with a load of other people, and there they were, just standing there and pottering across the road. My heart was just oh, amazing. This guy standing next to me said, uh, what do you think? And I said, oh, it's just amazing. And he said, no, it's not. He's a farmer. <clears throat> so the farmers really were not happy. Just to put this in context, this particular population, which is quite a small area, is now 1.9 million animals. That's more than the entire population in the, eight, in, in the 80s and 90s. Farmers pretty annoyed. So the expert mission was there for international experts to come and be shouted at by farmers. Um, <laughs> someone had to do the job. Uh, so we've got a picture there of a farmer uh, telling my colleague that his grass had lo was, was nice and grassy and now it isn't because some cygers came along and ate it all and what are we going to do about it? It's our cygers. And the best bit was we'd had a long day. We drove and drove. We, I mean, in these missions, you never get told what you're going to do next. I mean, I think it's part of the fun for, for the people who are hosting you, I think. So we drove and drove. We saw the Saigas. We turned up at this village hall. We went into the village hall, and there were 60 farmers who'd come from all around to tell us off. And the ministry guy who was with us said, OK, guys, 
stand up and tell the farmers what you think and what you think we should do about this. Okay. <laughs> In Russian, I should say. <laughs> so, yeah. That was exciting. And so that's another story that I'm not going to finish because the story hasn't finished and the Kazakh government is now still thinking about what to do with this other problem. So the problem was, Saiga's about to go extinct. Now the problem is, Saiga's eating all the farmers' grass, everyone annoyed. Um, so, TBD. So I'm just going to tell my last little story about Saiga's. This is from a different part of the range. And this, this particular Saiga story is something that I hope puts it into a broader context. This is the Aral Sea. So, in its time, it was the fourth largest inland sea in the world. It's another one with ancient culture and history. So Alexander founded a, a city there. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful place. In its delta, people lived, they farmed, it was very lush, they could grow all sorts of things, and um, a beautiful place. It was a place that also fueled Soviet-era prosperity. So Munak, which is the, the, the town right on the bottom of the Aral Sea in the delta, was a huge Soviet-era port, a naval port. It also had a massive fishery that supplied most of the Soviet Union and its satellite states. And yeah, the other thing that it had was cotton. And that was its downfall. Cotton is very hungry for water and for pesticides. So many of the rivers that came into the Aral Sea were diverted into the cotton fields. And here's the result. So these are satellite images from 1970s through to 2014, showing the sea drying up rapidly. And that caused a horrendous environmental disaster, possibly one of the lesser, lesser known, but one of the most severe man-made environmental disasters we've yet had on the planet. I'm sure we can make some more, but up to this point, this is one of the worst. So the dry seabed started blowing over a large part of northern Uzbekistan, taking with it the salt and the pesticides, causing cancers, birth defects. Um, obviously, the fishery was ruined, that people, uh, people's livelihoods were, um, were ruined, so lots of ill health, lots of livelihood loss, lots of ecological loss the endemic fish species gone, uh, and so on. So, bad. For a while, the Soviets uh, tried to build canals that would take the boats from the town where it was further and further into the sea, but they had to give up on that in the end. And that bottom picture is a picture of the, of the sea scarp uh, and the sea quite a long way away. One of the most famous bits of Munak is the uh, ship graveyard. This is a picture I took uh, from, um, from what was the seashore, looking down onto the ships and over far, far, far into the distance is a muddy pond. Um, so, our sea disaster. Let's see if we can find some hope. In the middle of the Aral Sea was an island called Resurrection Island. That island was a closed island. It was actually cut off from the rest of the, um, the steppe, so it became an island about 400 years ago. And since then, it had been completely isolated, except that it has a biochemical, a bio, a bio military biochemical um, plant there. So it was a closed island where they did bioweapons. Um, nice. So, yeah, there's a picture from the top when it was still, in the 80s, still active. Um, in about 2012, the Uzbek government decided that it was safe to go onto the island again. It had been decontaminated. And so looters came in, and they, basically the, the buildings have now gone, which is kind of sad because I think a bit of Cold War heritage tourism might have been a way forward. Um, the looters came in, they took all the stuff away, and the biologists came in, my friends. And they went and looked around the island, and what they found was magical. It hadn't been grazed, it hadn't been visited, it hadn't been poached for all these years, and there was this really lush and unusual uh, flora. There were beautiful uh, wildlife, uh, there was wolves, there were um, hares and things like that. 
and Saigas. The Saigas had survived. There, there was a population of Saigas on this island. There's some Saiga tracks. So when the looters came, the poachers came too. But the Saigas hang on in there still because you can see how deep their little uh, hooves are in the mud. Um, Saigas can run out onto the salty sea bottom uh, as, as where the, the sea was, the mud and the salt pans, and escape from the poachers. Poachers can't drive out because they get stuck. So the, the Saigas are still hanging on in there in Resurrection Island. Elsewhere in this part of Uzbekistan, the rest of the misery had happened, continued. So there was heavy poaching, the Saiga population went down to virtually nothing. Um, further dismay when in 2012 the um, Kazakh government built a fence, a border fence between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. This population used to migrate between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan in their seasonal migrations. The fence stopped them. The idea of the fence was that it was a customs union with Belarus, Russia, and Kazakhstan to stop drug traffickers. I mean, I would have thought that any drug tra trafficker with a pair of secateurs could get through that in like two minutes, um, but a saiga couldn't. Um, so that also stopped their migration, bad things. But this discovery that there was still a small resident population on Resurrection Island allowed us to uh, suggest to the government that they could make it a protected area. My colleagues started training guards. Uh, only last, I think two years ago, the protected area was announced. Um, we've been working with uh, local communities to help them with tourism and homestays. Uh, we've been working with the, with the oil companies who are um, all over the plateau to help them to think about can they do alternative livelihoods for people? Can they do something that will help um, people to stop poaching. Lots and lots of work with children as well um, to try to inspire that generation about the environment, the broader environment, uh, which has been so miserable, but, you know, is it something that they can be proud of? I love this picture. So these, this is drawn by kids who'd never seen a saiga. Um, it's a nice picture of a saiga. Um, but also what I like is that every picture that these kids drew also had water in it. Saigas don't actually like water very much. You wouldn't necessarily see them that often sitting in the water. But water is such a precious thing for people there because it's the, it's the resource that's most lacking. And so to draw saigas and water is to say, this is a precious thing. So that's great. And also, actually, the Aral Sea is not so very devoid of nature. So the Aral Sea is starting to regenerate I wouldn't say regenerate, it's starting to become a new thing, a new ecosystem, one that we've never had before. It's now called the Aral Kum Desert. And um, you can see these sprouting tamarisk trees. There's a bit of planting done, but it's also a little bit of natural regeneration. There are still water bodies, some of which are really quite nice, and they have birds and things. So although it's never going to be that beautiful sea that it once was, never going to be that again, it isn't going to be nothing. And I think this is a kind of lesson for us about what we need to think about for the future. We need to think towards future ecosystems, more in the past, but think to the future. And so for me, it's really lovely that the island is called Resurrection Island, because it is a form of resurrection. And it is a hopeful story. It's a story that, um, you know, we can kind of get around. We can actually think these people care about their nature. There is some way in which we can get some tourism out there we can actually start to build a sustainable future for people and wildlife in that area. And I just want to take you out into the bigger picture now with that thought in your head. So we're bombarded by bad news about the environment, about climate, about, about nature. We're bombarded with images of over-exploitation, of uh, forest clearance, of smogs because of forest fires, of pollution. Extinction, so since I graduated from New College, nine birds have been officially got, uh, reported as extinct. Here's a little mouse thing that uh, was the first victim of climate change, the first official species to have gone extinct through climate change. That's quite a nice um, badge of honor, isn't it? Um, so it's very hard as a conservation scientist to stay positive in the light of all of this. And actually, as a member of the general public, it's hard to stay positive. 
But I hope my story about Saigus has given you the idea that there's tragedy, but there's also beauty, and there's also hope. And a lot of that hope resides in people, in how people actually do care about nature. Here's some more kids' pictures. I particularly like the Saiga on top of the world. I think, you know, the Saiga does rule the world, so, you know, it's a good thing. Based upon all of that, in 2017, I founded something called Conservation Optimism. It's made for everybody, but it's particularly made for conservationists and young conservationists who might feel it's really difficult to go on. How can I go into this profession where there's so much despair and so little hope? And it's to try to help people to come together and realize that there can be success. We can do it. Here's some conservation optimists um, at, at one of our summits. And I think these women are expressing things very nicely. So because I need to believe and because the world needs me to believe. Um, perseverance is key, and I believe that we're here to win that battle. And there is no use being a pessimist, which really resonates with me. So, that's me. I just want to thank you very much for letting me tell you my Saiga Saga. And I also just want to finish by thanking New College. I mean, I think New College, uh, for all the hundreds of years that you've been here, has been somewhere where knowledge can thrive, where you can in inspire and nurture young minds. Thank you for doing that for me and for all the other undergraduates um, and researchers who've gone through your doors. And may it continue for a long time. Thank you. That was so interesting. It's nice to get a hopeful perspective as well. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. So if anyone wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand. And I think we have a portable microphone. Yeah. Um, oh, Ali, whatever. Um. Um, I'm sorry, it's a dreary one. But how has the, the war in Russia impacted your work? Um, because I noticed when you um, I mean, obviously, there's a significant Saiga population in, in uh, southern Russia, and you, at the start, your conference in Samarkand, I noticed, I don't think you mentioned any Russian delegate. And are they also uh, important players in the process, and has kind of cooperation with them ended as a result of the war and the ability to enter southern Russia? Yeah, it's, it's incredibly sad. So... Um, we supported some, uh, so currently in Ukraine, uh, they don't have any wild saigas, but they had a huge reserve that had been there since 1902, I think, with a wild si with a wildish saiga herd in there. We supported them uh, for a while. They're near Odessa, though, and now it is no more, uh, which is tragic. Russia, I went there every other year for decades, um, my colleagues in Russia are devastated, ashamed, um, isolated. It's hor horrible for them. My program manager, who was based in Moscow, who, who's a young woman, has now moved to Bulgaria. But my, my long-term colleague is just stuck there in her flat, desperate. So, tragedy. We, in 2022... Um, when war broke out, so Saturday, two years ago, I spent the day transferring a whole year's worth of money to my friends in Russia to, to fund their petrol, their children's education, all the stuff that they do. That's run out now. There will be no more until the war is over, um, not just because of the Charity Commission here, but also because... I can't be responsible for their safety. If they were seen to be getting foreign money, they could be put in jail. I mean, the tragedy is, for example, I mean, the whole thing is just regressing. So WWF Russia was the most establishment NGO there. So it was the one that was really close with government and was really influential. They were disbanded and prescribed. Um, so it's not safe to do conservation in Russia anymore and there will be no more money from my organization. Um, we've got time for one more question.
really good questions. Um, so the saiga is it's a species that run, runs hot. I think it's the best way to think about it. So it invests a lot in its reproduction, but it also tends to crash. So um, there have been a number of different incidences of disease or, or harsh winters when the population crashes. And what that means is, you know, we often think about conservation needing f of rare species, so small populations of rare species. But species like this shows that you need large populations of common species. They need big areas so that they don't... So the danger is, if you have a small population of these kinds of species and they have one of their crashes, they can't get back out again. So in the 80s, when the population was, was larger, uh, they lost about 50%, but 50% weren't affected, and so they could come back really quickly. In this case, there was, all of them were affected, and we were lucky to keep that population. In terms of why the 80s and now and not before, I really don't know. So we went through all the hypotheses that we could find, was it an environmental toxin? No. Was it to do with the vegetation? No. Was it a virus? No. You know, were the, were the animals really skinny? No. You know, there, there's nothing that we can see apart from this uh, weather anomaly, but there are years in which there's been a similar weather anomaly and no mass death. So we're thinking now, technical, uh, about the microbiome and about potentially uh, has there been a shift? In, this is the kind of bacteria that live in our in our bodies. Has there been a shift in the microbiome? Uh, there was a student in the department who looked at that, couldn't find anything, um, but it might be part of the answer. Also, has there been some kind of mutation in the bacteria that was kind of subclinical, so just spread throughout the population subclinically, and then when there was the switch, it became virulent? But we haven't got a way to test that. But it's always, the species is always going to have these crashes. So the important thing is that we make sure that it's healthy in every other way, so when it has these crashes, it comes back. Perfect. Um, I think that's all we have time for, but thank you so much. Um, should we do another round of applause? Uh,